Well, good afternoon. Welcome to another daily devotion. It's great to be together again for another day and another week in order to open up God's word and see what he has to say. Before we march forward, I just want to highlight a couple of things going on. You'll see the slide rolling past over there. Let me encourage you to go check out foundedingrace.org. Wonderful place to be able to plug into what's going on in our denomination and some thinking around the churches. Also, please don't forget to like and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. It is very helpful, helps spread stuff further. And of course, don't forget to check us out at Covenant Presbyterian Church. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the Word. And we're going to be turning through to Matthew chapter 24 again. Last week on Saturday, at least New Zealand Saturday time, we looked at the teaching of Jesus about his return. We're going back there again. We won't read the whole chapter because we read it last time. Rather, I just want us to jump into a couple of places. You can read it yourself or you can watch last week's devotion and you can hear me read it there if you'd like. I'd like us just to delve in and look at a couple of lessons. Last week, we walked through the passage and talked about how to understand it, how to read it, how to interpret it, because it's a notoriously challenging passage. And this week, I'd like us just to note three lessons that come out of what we read last week. So three lessons from the return of Jesus. But before we do that, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for another week. Thank you for another day. Thank you that we can love you and serve you. Thank you for your grace and mercy and your gospel, which has brought us into relationship with yourself. As we turn to your word again today, we ask that you would give us hearts and minds that are ready to understand and ready to feed upon your word. Lord, would you use it to change us so that we might become more like Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, chapter 24, and I said there are three reasons, no I didn't, I said three lessons that come from Matthew chapter 24. Three lessons that come from the return of Jesus. Now, each of these flow out of the reality that Christ will return. And it's very important to notice that. It's very important to note that the reason that we do these three things is because we have confidence that Jesus will return and God is in control of his return. So we talked about last time that Jesus was encouraging his disciples and comforting them with his leaving. And so what are the three lessons that come out of the knowledge that Jesus Christ will return one day? Well, firstly, Jesus tells his disciples not to be led astray. Have a look at verse 4 with me. Jesus answered them and said, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And then have a look at verse 23 with me. If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Well, Jesus came as the Messiah. Well, I should say Jesus was the Messiah. And he came proclaiming the kingdom of God. With his departure, Jesus says, many people would, would rise up and they would say, look at me, look at me, I'm the Christ. And we have seen this throughout history, haven't we? In, in New Zealand, up in Auckland, I'm not sure if it's anywhere else, but up in Auckland, there's a movement that comes out of South Korea. And in this movement, I won't attempt to say the name because it's a South Korean name and I'm just going to butcher it, but there movement says that the Messiah has come and he's in South Korea. And so we must get on board with them. And this is just one example of what's happened all throughout history. Many different people have said that they are the true Christ. They are the true Messiah. And they have led many astray. 
Jesus says to his disciples, do not be led astray by them. You must be on guard. You must be on guard against false teachers, false prophets, and false messiahs. Jesus knows that there's going to be a gap between his leaving and his coming again. God has ordained the day of their return, of his return, I should say, and Jesus knows that there will be a period of time when the church is here without the physical presence of the Messiah. And so people will come and try and lead them astray. And the disciples and we are to be on guard. We're to protect ourselves against these people. Well, how do we do that? How do we protect ourselves? Jesus gives us a small clue here in verse 27. He says, As the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. What does that mean? What does it mean for the lightning to shine in the east and be seen in the west? Well, obviously what Jesus is saying is that at his return, there will be no question as to whether he's returned or not. When, when false messiahs come in the east, the people in the west have no idea. When false prophets come in America, the people in Africa have no idea about it. But when Jesus returns and is seen in America, he will also be seen in Africa. Now, obviously, Jesus doesn't tell us how that can be. The point is not to give us a metaphysical understanding of the return of Christ, but rather to highlight for us that when he returns, every single person will know. And so one of the ways that we can guard ourselves against false messiahs is to recognize that at the return of Christ, every single human being will know that Christ has returned. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So when you hear of someone saying, oh, we've found the Messiah, you can say, no, that's not true. Because at the return of Christ, I will know that Christ has returned. And so you can be confident that you've not missed out. So first, we're to be on guard so we're not led astray. Secondly, we're not to be alarmed. Have a look at verse 6. We'll start at verse 5. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for not my name's sake. What does Jesus tell us? Well, Jesus tells us that lots of stuff's going to happen. I'm not sure if you've heard this, but as a pastor, you hear all sorts of stuff. And I've had quite a few people ask me, do you think, talking about coronavirus and the state of the nations, do you think the end is almost here? Is this the sign that Jesus is about to come back? And as you look at the world and you see nations fighting each other, and as you see viruses rolling out, and as you see plagues and famines and earthquakes, there is a temptation to think maybe now is the time. Jesus says, don't be alarmed, these things are going to happen. Throughout history, there are going to be wars, earthquakes, famines, plagues, viruses. And not one of them means, specifically, it is the time for the return of Jesus. There's no way in which we are to look at history and say, ah, now, now is the time that Jesus will come. What Jesus is pointing out is that lots of events are going to happen over and over and over again. But there will come a day when Jesus returns. And so when we see coronavirus, when we see earthquakes, we shouldn't be alarmed. Jesus has told us these things will happen. We shouldn't be worried. We shouldn't be scared. But rather, what these things should do is comfort us and encourage us. 
Why? Because he told us they were going to happen. It's a little bit like when you're a child and you're going to go somewhere with your parents and they say, okay, so what's going to happen is we're going to go to the mall and when we get to the mall, there's going to be some people there. There's going to be some protesters outside. But don't worry. We're going to go through the protesters into the mall. And as a child, when you get there and you see the protesters, rather than being filled with fear, though you might be a little bit anxious, rather than being filled with fear, there is a sense of confidence in you because your parents told you this would happen. And so it is with the return of Christ. When we see coronavirus, what we should be filled with is comfort and encouragement and assurance because Jesus told us these things would happen. But then lastly, so number one, we are to not be led astray. We're to guard ourselves. Number two, we're not to be alarmed, but we're to be assured when things happen in the universe. And thirdly, we are to not be caught off guard. Have a look later in the section, verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 42. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. And then he tells this little parable. Know this, if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have left his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. We are to be on guard. We are to be ready. We are not to be caught off guard. You see, we don't live as people who have no idea what's going to happen. Rather, we live as disciples who know with assurance that one day Christ is going to return. This is probably one of the big areas that we really need to work on in the church. When you talk to people in the West, I'm not sure about the East, but in the West, people are so comfortable in this world, that they act like they've always got 70, 80, 90 years of life, that they will live to be old, and that Jesus will not return in their age. After all, it's been 2,000 years. What's another thousand? Jesus says we're not to live like that. We are to live as men and women expecting Christ to return. Now, there's two implications for that. Firstly, that means we should be ready for the return of Christ. So we don't live with the expectation of living to old age. But also, we should make use of the time we have. I remember someone once, well, I can't say I remember, I read that someone once asked Martin Luther what he would do if he knew that Christ was returning tomorrow. And he said, I would plant a tree. Now, that may seem a bit ridiculous to me or to you, but, but you get the point, don't you? Martin Luther's point was, I'm going to do the same thing I always do. I'm going to live faithfully before God because that's what I should be doing every day of the week. Once some person asked John Calvin a similar question, what would you do if you knew Christ was returning? And he said, I would prepare my sermon for Sunday. Or something to that effect anyway. And, and of course the point is, every day we seek to live faithfully as we would want God to find us when Jesus returns. One man who sort of summarized this so beautifully is Jonathan Edwards, who said, I will live every day as I would want to be living at the return of Christ. And that's the real implication from all of these things, isn't it? We're not to be led astray, but we're to hold firm, standing firm to the confession of faith, expecting Christ to return. We're not to be afraid or alarmed because we're going to be found confident at the return of Christ. 
And we're not to be caught off guard at the return of Christ because we live every day as though he was returning. And so that raises a few challenges for you and I, doesn't it? How are we living our life? How are you living your life? Is your life marked by a person who expects to see Jesus today? Because the truth of the matter is, you do. Though you may not see him with physical eyes, by faith, you live every day with him, don't you? And every day he looks upon you. So let us be spurred on by this teaching of Jesus to live faithfully today and each day going forward. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this teaching of Jesus Christ in your holy word, and we pray that you would use it to spur us on to faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining me for another Tuesday, another Daily Devotion. I will see you tomorrow for another episode of The Daily Devotion. God bless.